we're going to get started. Okay. Okay. Um, good evening. Thank you so much for coming to the David Burke Foundation Lectures. Um, Rabbi Ethan, Tuck Ethan Tucker's um, Lectures on Core uh, Foundations of Jewish Law. Um, I'm delighted that um, you're all here tonight. I know we have a lot of competition with some beautiful weather. So, um, Rabbi Ethan Tucker is uh, one of our Rosh Yeshiva and also our Chair of Jewish Law. And this is our third lecture in a series of lectures on core issues of Jewish law. Um, we'd like to publicly thank the David Burke Foundation for making these lectures possible. Um, so tonight's lecture format, unlike many learning experiences at Yeshiva Hadar, will be a lecture. So we're handing out an outline of the lecture as well as source sheets for you to follow along. And if you weren't able to join us for the past two lectures, you can catch up after by visiting our website where they're available both in podcast and video form. Um, so great, uh, without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Rabbi Ethan Tucker. Thank you. So for reasons we won't go into in depth, I'm going to sit, at least at the beginning, uh, and uh, speak in a slightly less projecting tone of voice than I usually do. You can ask the, the fellows at the yeshiva more about that. Um, okay, so uh, the sources are going around here and uh, I'm also going to, let me also announce that I'm gonna ask you all to pitch in during the, uh, during the course of this lecture since it is more source heavy. Uh, I'm gonna ask you all to uh, read and chip in and be, uh, be a part of unpacking the material. Enjoin upon them the laws and the teachings and make known to them the way they are to go and the practices they are to follow. In the shadow of Sinai, uh, Yitro, Moshe's father-in-law, sums up in this pasuk the essence of what applied Torah is. First, et asher It must be a path. It must have a direction and a purpose that leads to something, that means something. Not just a random <coughs> assortment of legal data points to be followed. And two, et asher yasun, There must be concrete actions that can realize that purpose. Specific steps we can take, not just to believe in that mission, but to actually make it a reality. We've spent time over the course of this series talking about the community of halacha, what that community is supposed to look like, the ways in which the discourse of halacha and the Jewish people as a whole can be more unified and a whole as one. We've spent time talking about the kind of theology and philosophy of halacha that can put us on a meaningful path towards God and Torah without crushing ourselves in the process. Tonight, we have to talk about how we actually articulate law in halachic discourse. And I have to make the case to you that we can say what needs to be said. We're going to spend most of tonight on the nitty gritty details of a number of areas of law with the goal of showing how we can and must take ownership of Yitro's challenge to construct a path of meaning and to give it concrete expression. In a way, and many of you who have been here the past two weeks have heard this bubble up in various forms, there are two challenges that always resurface when trying to think about a halakha that could be meaningful and substantive, worthy of our respect and not just of our obedience. The first is, and this was asked explicitly as a question last week, aren't there some cases where you just get shut down? where the system, the discourse, the data points of halakha say one thing, and no matter how badly you want to say something else, you won't be able to. Isn't that the case? That's challenge one. Challenge two is, if we do find a way to say those bold things that we sometimes want to say in this legal language, how can we avoid turning our practice into something that no longer resembles Judaism? Do the boundaries simply go out the window when we enter into a conversation where we insist 
that substance and meaningful substance must always be front and center. We're going to attempt, we'll see how well we do, to answer those questions tonight uh, with a close look at what I'm calling category shifts. Category shifts in halakha where a term that is used to describe a given legal concept or practice or person ends up taking on a different meaning at a different point in time, thus displaying a fidelity to the ideas lying behind the law while departing from its external language. These kinds of category shifts are the boldest sort of halachic shifts that one can find. They are simultaneously the most satisfying and also the most destabilizing. And what I hope we'll show by the end of this evening is two things in response to our two challenges. One, yes, you really can say very bold things in halachic language, and to the extent you can't, it's more likely because you don't want to or because it's not compelling to do so, but not because it's impossible. And many of the category shifts that we will see will light that path for us. The second, which responds to the fear of boundaries, is to remind ourselves that, in fact, there is really no safe read of the sources that avoids interpretation. And that is because of what I referred to last week as the conundrum of application. The fact that even a fundamentalist must deal with the fact that if I literally and uncreatively apply the word of God, Indeed, especially so, I must figure out what God's word means. And I have to, on some level, enter into the conversation of the difference between the signifier and the signified. The uncreative application of a given word across time, space, culture, as if I am simply conserving an earlier manifestation of the law, is in fact, at times, a reckless application of an earlier law that departs from its meaning, purpose, and intent. And while we must indeed come up with some boundaries for this process, I hope to suggest some by the end of the evening, the need for those boundaries does not exempt us from engaging with the substance. So with that, I really want to jump now right in to the, uh, the examples that I want to explore with you tonight. You have on the sheets in front of you a number of different issues. And we're going to work up through them from some of the most innocuous and seemingly picayune ones to begin to establish a certain kind of pattern, a certain kind of interpretive and legal pattern, building up towards some of the core issues of identity and personhood and definition of Jewish community. Uh, by way of seeing that some of those most difficult issues that we confront already have potential solutions in the tools of legal conversation throughout other parts of halachic discourse. So with that, let's jump into the first example. Here are the two categories that we will deal with are laundering and ironing not things that seem to be on the top of uh, the world's most pressing agenda, but something familiar to observant Jews from the days leading up to Tisha B'Av. In anticipation of that central day of mourning on the Jewish calendar, there are a range of restrictions that are aimed at essentially creating a kind of world of desolation parallel to the, uh, the historical desolation that that day marked. One of the ways that that plays out is in the Talmud Bavli and Ta'anit, a source, there's many sources, but you'll see why I cited this one in a minute, that lays out, Asur lechabes lifnei Tisha B'Av. It is forbidden to launder before Tisha B'Av. And then, a source indicating, a, a next phrase, indicating the uh, Babylonian provenance of this, uh, of this source, the text goes on to say, but our ironing is like their laundry. Meaning, the category of laundry, which is forbidden in this text, assumes a context of Eretz Yisrael, of the land of Israel. 
We, however, who live in Babylonia, actually have to translate that category of laundering into our category of iron. Not with a plug-in electrical appliance, but with some kind of stone that was used to smooth out the garment and make it look like new. Now, if I can have someone read Rashi on Ta'anit here, who lays out more clearly what the ramifications of that are. Okay. Why don't we read in English? Our ironing is not any better than their laundering, and it is forbidden to iron before Tishabah, but our laundry is permitted. Okay, so the ramifications of the category shift are clear. That is to say, the laundry that was forbidden in Eretz Yisrael, in the context of Bavel, even though it is called kibbutz, it is called laundering, is not actually the intent of the source. That the sensitivity to not what the word is that describes the category, but what the category means actually leads to a totally different legal regime. And as a result, according to this text, even as a faithful person to the text that says laundering is forbidden in the days leading up to Tisha B'Av, it might actually nonetheless be permissible to launder in the days leading up to Tisha B'Av if the laundry that I am speaking about in one context is not the same as the laundry being spoken about in the earlier normative text. Okay? That is a kind of basic, as I said, almost simplistic, seemingly innocuous shift but a category shift nonetheless, a model already laid out in the Talmud itself for taking a word and understanding that the straight up application of that word to another context, in this case, another land, another material culture, actually produces a distortion of the law if done directly, and one needs to approach the problem differently. Now, that does not end matters. And we find that, in fact, there is some hesitancy about this category shift, and this is a pattern we'll return to again and again. Category shifts, while present and prominent in halakha, nonetheless, generally don't go uncontested. So let's now just hear the next two sources, the Tosafot and the Ran, who will play this out further. Emily, would you read those two sources? People are stringent with respect to our laundry on account of established practice. To do laundry in Eretz Yisrael is forbidden because their clothes are truly white. But in Babylonia it is permitted because they do not truly, they do not get truly white since their waters are cloudy. For it is not a land of mountains and valleys like Eretz Yisrael. Therefore, laundry in these lands might well be considered like the laundry of Eretz Yisrael. So, beginning with the second source, the Ran first, and here we're in medieval Spain in the 14th century, we find that. First, he lays out more clearly what the distinction is. Why are the land of Israel and Babylonia different? And it goes to the quality of their water. The fact is, Babylonia has brackish water, canals coming off the Euphrates in a way that it's full of silt, in a way that that water simply doesn't clean clothing in the same way. That water that comes down in streams that rush down from mountains into valleys is much purer. And therefore, he explains, based on that, the reason for the original category shift in the first place. But then we see two dynamics here. First, we find that in the Tosafot, despite the fact that they seem to buy this logic that the category shift is valid, there's popular resistance to actually putting it into practice. As it were, the word kibbutz, the word laundry, carries with it a certain kind of power, staying power, inertial cultural force, that despite the fact that they don't dispute the analysis here of those categories being different, they report a reluctance of people to actually embrace that category. The Ran, in a way, does one better in that he says, well, if I take the category shift seriously, I have to imagine to myself that it might shift yet again. Just because I am the heir to the Babylonian Talmud in terms of my intellectual, religious, and cultural life, that does not mean that I can then pretend that I live in Babylonia if I live in Spain. And if the rivers in Spain are more similar to the rivers of Eretz Israel, then perhaps the category switches back whence it began, and the conversation begins all over again. So this first example shows some of those key dynamics that we'll see again and again. On the one hand, taking for granted that of course one has to engage more than the surface words and actually go to the meaning of what the law is about. Two, the caution with which people often 
embrace category shifts and sometimes resist them. And three, the notion that if one takes seriously engaging the substance of the law, that can't just be a subterfuge for abrogating the law, but actually has to kick off a live conversation that may take any number of unpredicted turns later on along the line. That's our first example. Okay? Now we'll move on to another example where we'll see, similarly, in a small matter, a bold shift and its resistance. So we begin now with Mishnah Shabbat on the bottom of the first page. And here we're transported <coughs> to the world of preparation of food right before the onset of Shabbat. And the question being, on what kinds of heat sources may I put food that still has to be cooked somewhat uh, right as Shabbat is entered? What kind of setup may I have that will permit that? And the Mishnah in Shabbat talks about two kinds of heating appliances. It talks about a kira and it talks about a tanur. And more or less, a kira is what we would think of as a range. One cooks on top of something that is heated from underneath. And a tanur is what we think of as an oven, an enclosed space that has been fired up with heat, and the food is placed inside of it. And the text is very clear that one may put food on top of a range that has been fired with minimal fuel. In this case, the example is straw. But one may not put it on top of one that has been fired with wood, which will create a more serious heat source. And an oven is completely out of bounds. Now, the axis here of discussion has a long history to it, but the simplest reading of the Mishnah is straightforward. The question is, how hot is the thing? A range with minimal fuel has very little heat. It will dissipate. It is not like really putting something on a cooking surface. A tanur, an oven, because of its insulated closed space, even with the most minimal heat fed into it, is a real serious heat source, and therefore is to be avoided, according to this Mishnah, going into Shabbat. And so we have a rule that breaks down very clearly. The kira with minimal fuel is OK. The tanur is unacceptable. Now, laterally transitioning for a minute to Bavli Baba Batra, we get into the details of zoning one's house and the question of the neighbors downstairs and what kind of responsibility one has to them. Before there were co-op rules demanding 80% carpet coverage, there was Mishnah Baba Batra. And the Mishnah and Baba Batra says that if one puts an oven in the second floor of a building, you must have at least three tfachim, a tefach being a hand breadth, so about four inches or so, so we're talking about 12 inches, to protect the downstairs tenant, the insulation. There must be enough of a kind of coating on your floor, their ceiling, uh, to insulate uh, the downstairs neighbor uh, with an oven, and with a range, a tefach suffices. Again, totally proportionate to the picture of heat that we've played out here, where the oven is a much more serious source of heat and therefore requires more insulation. But it is taught, says the Gemara, in another source, that an oven requires four tfachim, not three, and a range three, not one. How can these sources be reconciled with their different standards? Abaye comes in and says, that latter teaching of four and three refers to the appliances of a baker. And our ovens, those of us who just have regular ovens for our own use at home, those are like the ranges of a baker, both of which require three tfachim. Again, a direct engagement with the question of heat. And here, too, in the Gemara, a sense that the same word can mean different things in different contexts. Tanur, while used to mean oven, means very different things when it is essentially an industrial oven as opposed to when it is an oven in one's house. If one just blindly applies the term tanur and assumes that all ovens are ovens and they need the same kind of requirement, one gets a contradiction between these two texts. But once one properly penetrates to the meaning behind that term in its local context, then we can figure out how they resolve. Now, that text then becomes a key weapon in the arsenal of Rabbeinu Hananel, who in North Africa in the 10th century wants to say something more dramatic about our Mishnah. Whether he does this because of practice or not is unclear, but let's say it this way. Under the regime of the Mishnah in Shabbat, 
someone who would want to put food in their oven on Shabbat would simply be in violation of that Mishnah. It would be forbidden, or even going into Shabbat, right? Putting food into the oven, going into Shabbat, would be in total violation of that Mishnah. And one would have either the choice of simply saying, I can't do that, or violating wantonly the Mishnah. Rabbeinu Hananel, possibly influenced by actual practice in this regards, says, we don't have to make that choice. Why? Because we hold that our Mishnah in Shabbat borrowing the terminology from Baba Batra, refers to a baker's oven. But our ovens are like the ranges of a baker. And since a range going into Shabbat is permissible to put food on, then it now becomes permissible for me to put food in an oven going into Shabbat because it's not really an oven, it's actually a range. Now, let's pause here for a minute. Right? This can begin to sound like what the meaning of is is. And the question of, is this simply a playing with legal language in order to get to whatever desired result? But I don't think that's what's going on. And as we see more and more examples, I hope you become more and more convinced. I think what we actually have here is a working out of the fact that ovens and the heat sources in people's homes changed and took different forms over time. And that Rabbeinu Hananel and the other sources engaging with this here are trying to say, don't fetishize the word of it, actually engage with an analysis of what is going on. And it could be that the legal category of kira, of range, is a more appropriate match for the material category of oven, of tanur, that you are grappling with in your house. Okay? Again, a category shift based on engaging with the substance. And again, I brought you here a passage from the Mishnah Bura, who cites secondhand the Maharshal of Shlomo Luria in 16th century Poland, who resists this and says, no, no, no. An oven is an oven is an oven. Just like we saw with the Tosafot resisting the laundry ironing category shift, so here too, there is a category shift, but it doesn't get complete universal assent. I didn't bring you all of the history here of how this plays out in the Shulchan Aruch in the interest of time, but if you trace the halacha conversation here, you will find the voices in favor of the category shift and those that resist it. Again, demonstrating the possibility of articulating these kinds of shifts in halachic language, and nonetheless, the reality that they don't always catch on like wildfire without opposition. Okay, let's go to the next category, which is very appropriate for today's adventures at Yeshiva Hadar. And this, I think, is a fairly uh, remarkable example of not even quite a category shift, but a dramatic category expansion. The location of what was kind of a corner of the halacha conversation on a certain topic that ends up taking up most of the space in the room. So let's look at the first two sources which lay the groundwork for this. Uh, Gilad, would you read for me Mishnah Shabbat 16.8 and then Talmud Bavli Beit 22a. If a Gentile lights a candle on Shabbat for himself, then a Jew may also benefit from it. But if it was lit for a Jew, then it is forbidden to use it. Said Ula the son of Rav Eli, all the needs of a sick person may be done via a Gentile on Shabbat. And said Rav Amnuna, in any situation of illness, where there is no danger to life, one instructs a Gentile to do the forbidden acts. Okay, there are two core principles here. The first, which is most important for this category is, one may not have a Gentile light a fire for a Jew on Shabbat, or any other forbidden melacha that is being done specifically for the Jew. If it's done, and it's done for the purposes of the Gentile, and then it's sitting there, the Mishnah tolerates the Jew to come and benefit from it afterwards. But it is explicit that one certainly cannot tell a Gentile to light a fire for you on Shabbat. You can't even benefit from it if it was done on your behalf. That's the clear black letter law that emerges from that Mishnah, which is uncontested. Now, there is, however, there are situations where one may tell a Gentile to do things on Shabbat. Among them is the case of a person who is sick. Now. We're not talking about someone who is sick on pain of death, because for that person, 
the Jew could violate Shabbat under the principle of pikuach nefesh and saving a life and trumping Shabbat. But here we're talking about someone who occupies a kind of middle state. They are not deathly ill, but they are in some serious discomfort and pain. They're laid up in bed, whatever it is. And while they could make it through Shabbat, it would be with some great suffering and discomfort. In that case, we don't really have the right to override Shabbat with a full-blown Jewish violation thereof. But we do, according to this text, have the license to use a Gentile, someone for whom it is not Shabbat today, and violate the normal rule of not benefiting from their direct actions on our behalf. So far, so good. Now let's look at the next source. We go from the world of Eretz Yisrael, <coughs> Bavel, all not so far from the equator, to northern Germany. And the Maharami Rotenberg tells us the following. You asked about the Gentile women who heat up the furnace on Shabbat. In France, in the home of my teacher, they were lenient. And my teacher said that Rabbi Yaakov of Orléans even permitted to instruct a Gentile to light the fire under the permission to tell a Gentile to perform melacha for a sick person. Since we are all sick with respect to fire, were we to sit in the freezing cold. <laughs> the phrase in the Hebrew is hakol cholim etzel ha'esh. However, in our land, I think we should forbid under the rubric of forbidding permitted things when others have already treated them stringent. What is the Maharam saying? First of all, he reports this tradition of the Ri of Orleam, which is a sort of staggering expansion of this earlier category where effectively you now say that the entire population is sick with respect to being freezing cold. And therefore, the rules of asking a Gentile to do something kick into gear, and one can now do exactly that which the Mishnah said was forbidden. One can tell the Gentile to light a fire on one's behalf. And this is laid out under that logic. You then see the Maharam resisting that, at least in his own lands, but again, like the Tosafot, not based on the theory being flawed, but based on some degree of communal destabilization. He acknowledges that this is technically permitted and sound logic, but people have already assumed for too long that they can't tell a Gentile to light a fire on Shabbat, and therefore permitting that now would be too destabilizing. If you ended up in another place where that pattern was not established, it would be okay, even according to the Maharaj. Now again here, on first blush you can say, what a great legal trick. What a great way to get the Gentile to be able to do something that's forbidden by the Mishnah by saying something ridiculous. On the other hand, I would posit to you, I'm not sure it is so ridiculous. Which is to say, if the Mishnah had been written in Northern Europe, as opposed to in Eretz Yisrael, it might have been taken for granted that among the things that fit into the category of the kind of extreme discomfort that one is not required to bear on Shabbat is sitting in the freezing cold. That was not something that was foremost on the minds of those teaching the, the traditions in the Mishnah or in the Babli. But at the same time, it actually is potentially a direct engagement with, well, what are we actually talking about when we talk about the limits of a Gentile performing things for us on Shabbat? And to the extent the meaning and substance behind that conversation is, listen, a Gentile should not gratuitously be doing things for you on Shabbat, but it is appropriate for the Gentile to do things for you that will enable you to get through the Shabbat as a basically enjoyable day. Well, then it could be that in a different climate, in a different circumstance, things might look differently in terms of the legal regime. And here I want to emphasize to you the gap between the substance and the language. The substantive conclusion here I maintain to you is quite reasonable. It's only the language of all of us are sick that sounds strange, because what do you mean? You're all clearly not sick, you're fine. But the key here is that that language is used because that is the way that this substantive point of discomfort and the sort of unreasonable things that one need not bear on Shabbat was engaged by the earlier sources. And the way of putting that old wine in new bottles is to use that old terminology in order to get to that conclusion. We'll skip over the Shulchan Aruch's synthesis here, 
But suffice it to say, you can see there a kind of acceptance of the legal idea, uh, but at the same time, some resistance to its application. Okay, now we're going to move into something that is uh, shortly going to be very present and with us. And this goes to the question of reclining at the Seder. The Mishnah lays out in Mishnah Psachim 10.1, and we're now on page 3, so the second, second page on the first side. Even a poor Jew should not eat until reclining. And that's understood by the Talmud to be a requirement to recline. Now, let's remember, the context of this culturally is, we often talk about the Seder as having a relationship to the Greek symposium, but more importantly, it's related to the way people used to sit in the triclinium, the way they would re recline on couches when they ate a formal banquet. And the reason that there's an insistence on reclining is essentially to say, make sure that you're having a properly fancy meal, because that's what it means. And of course, you can't do that in a posture of freedom and relaxation without reclining. So what happens when I end up in a culture where no one eats on couches anymore? And where reclining no longer has anything to do with what establishes a fancy meal, which might now be used, might, might now be established by sitting at the dining room table as opposed to the eat-in kitchen, using the fine china, any number of other things. So into that breach steps the Rav Yah in 12th to 13th century German. Uh, let's get someone to read the next one. Hey, Tom, will you read that one, please? Uh, one returns home. Uh, one returns home and sits down and reclines. But today, when it's not common practice to recline, because three people do not have the practice of reclining, one should sit normally. And now we have the Hagahod Maimonios reacting a generation later. Ravia wrote that we do not recline nowadays since three people do not recline. And in fact, sitting normally is the true way of sitting in freedom. Nonetheless, he is a woman. Okay, we'll come back to the significance of this case. But you can see here the Ravia <coughs> attempts a category shift which is essentially to say, what does reclining mean? Reclining means sitting. Today, reclining means sitting. I, I should have begun with this. My favorite category shift of this part comes from the beginning of The Princess Bride. Peter Falk comes into the sick uh, Kevin Savage and says, when I was a kid, television was called books. Okay? <laughs> All right? So reclining is sitting. That's what it is for the Rav Yat, all right? The Hagahot Maimoniot, while acknowledging this, says that is a lone view. I have thoughts as to why this one gets off the ground less than the others. We'll come to that in a moment. But so you understand with the Rav Yat and the ramification of category shifts, and this is very important. We haven't yet really seen this. The plain sense of the Rav Yat is actually that it would be problematic to recline. That is to say, it might actually not be a sign of freedom to sit in your dining room chair, prop a little pillow here, and fall off the side <laughs> while you shove some matzah in your mouth. <laughs> Hard as that may be for many of you to imagine, that seems to be the Ravia's quite reasonable point. And that underscores also what's at stake with not engaging with a category shift sometimes. Sometimes insisting stubbornly on continuing the old form can not just fail to reach the message, but actively undermine the message and substance of what that form was about. To the extent I am trying to inculcate in people a sense at the Seder of derech cherut, of freedom, then if I put them in a posture that no longer symbolizes that, I may actually be undermining what the Seder is about. Nonetheless, Hagahod Maimoniot is not interested in going that direction. Now, there's a second element of reclining that develops, and you'll see now how these two interact. Here we get into who is required to recline, not just the position, and specifically the question of whether gender plays a role. So can someone read the next three sources? The Talmud Bavli, the Toldot Adam Bechava by Rabbeinu Yerucham, and the Shulchan Aruch uh, that follows it. Please. A woman, while in the presence of her husband, has no obligation to recline. But if she is an important woman, she must nonetheless recline. And now the Toldot Adam Yes. So, 
that Tosafot wrote that all of our women are considered important and thus are obligated to recline. But Rambam simply wrote that the average woman need not recline. <coughs> a woman needs not, need not recline unless she is important. Note, all of our women are considered important but they do not have the practice of reclining because they rely on the view of Rav Yah, who wrote that there is no longer an obligation for anyone to recline. <laughs> okay, so let's understand what happened here. It's actually a fascinating weaving together of two category shifts in the Shulchan Aruch here. First of all, the Gvara is very clear, which is to say women as a class do not by default recline. There's some argument over what it means in the presence of her husband, but let's certainly say wives as a class do not recline. And it is only an exceptional few who in fact are required to recline based on their steps. This view in the Tosafot then cited says, well, actually the status of women has changed in our society such that all women today are important. Now, that's another great example of that can't actually be true on the level of the language. The whole point of importance is most people are not important. That's why the people who are important are important. <laughs> but the point here is they are important in terms of what that category was trying to capture. That category was trying to capture the notion of someone who is possessed of enough social standing, independence, etc to warrant being in a posture of freedom as opposed to being in a posture of subservience. And therefore, in our society, say the Tosafot, and this maps very well to what we know about the place of women in early medieval Europe, particularly when contrasted later with their position in the Renaissance, which is they had significantly more power in Christian Europe than they did in Muslim lands, and significantly more power in the early Middle Ages than they did in the Renaissance, both as landowners, as brokers in communal affairs, etc., etc. This makes perfect sense as a cultural testimony to that fact that the Tosafo would have looked at women and say, these people clearly belong in the category that is a minority category in the Talmud, even if it will render them thereby a majority. And the Rambam, by the way, also is of a piece with what we know about the culture that he lives in, where the default is assumed not to be the case. The interesting thing, however, is despite the Tosafot's claim, the Ramar of Moshe Isserlis in the italicized portion of the Shulchan Aruch reveals that in 16th century Poland, this has not caught on. Now, whether this is because it never caught on, or because this is actually reflecting that shift to the Renaissance from the early Middle Ages that I'm talking about, I'm not in a position to tell you with any confidence. But whatever it may be, the women are not reclining in this source. And it's then only at that point that the Ramah, in order to salvage the Tosafot statement that they should be reclining, but also to salvage the practice of women who are not, and you should think back to the first lecture about that engagement with the halachic terminology in the whole community and its practice, there the Rav Yah can come into play. Even though the Rav Yah's logic of tossing reclining out the window was a dead letter, essentially, it does reemerge when combined with this gendered piece that seems to be playing. So you see there, again, a category shift not entirely successful in terms of the Rav Yah, one that is also not entirely successful in terms of women, but the ways in which sometimes two category shifts coming together sometimes can be enough to create the perfect storm to justify some sort of different approach to this in a way that each one on its own might not have been able to do. Okay? So, we leave that as uh, an example for you to ponder at the Seder uh, and to move forward with that. I want to skip forward now from the uh, example of uh, right and left. Perhaps we'll come back and talk about it if it comes up in the questions section. Uh, those sources deal fascinatingly with what does right mean? When sources talk about the right hand, do they mean the right hand or do they mean the dominant hand? And again, the need to engage not just the form and the surface language, but the meaning and to make a case one way or the other. Let's move on now to some of the most contentious issues of personality and being and citizenship. First, the status of deaf mutes in halakha. 
Deaf mutes are grouped by matter of course in early halachic sources with the shote and the katan, the mentally incapacitated person and the minor. The mentally incapacitated person and the minor clearly share in common lack of full intellectual capacity. And the cheresh, the deaf mute, is put in the same category. It's clearly treated that way. Everyone's valid to read the Megillah, except the deaf. Everyone is required to come on pilgrimage to Jerusalem, except the deaf. The deaf. If the ox of an intelligent person gores an ox of a deaf person, and here you see pikeach versus cheresh, someone who is, you know, batipakach na'ineshneihem, their eyes opened and they understood, they got it, as opposed to the deaf person who is not comprehending. The ox of an intelligent person gores an ox of a deaf person, a mentally incompetent person or a minor, the intelligent person is liable. But if the reverse, they are exempt. Deaf people are mentally incapacitated and unable to take, and un not expected in this case, to take responsibility for actions that happen under their purview. Then, however, we get an interesting text in Mishnah Trumot, which talks about now a deaf person who speaks, but who cannot hear. And this person, we're told, should not separate out truma, the gift for the Kohen, which requires intelligence, intent, focus. But if such a person did, the truma that is separated out for the priest is valid. And then the following claim. The deaf person about whom the sages spoke everywhere is one who can neither hear nor speak. So here we have actually the Mishnah beginning to undermine its own category, which is to say, don't think deaf means anyone who can't hear. If the person can't hear but they can speak, then they are already in a category of some degree of intelligence, social standing, social communication, not clear from the Mishnah, that puts them in a very different space and they have to be treated differently on a legal plane. The Bavli in Chagiga lays this out even more clearly by actually going to the heart of the matter of this grouping of deaf, imbecile, mentally incapacitated, and minor, and says, the Mishnah teaches about a deaf person who is similar to a mentally incompetent person and a minor. Just as those two do not have the requisite intelligence, so too a deaf person who does not have the requisite intelligence. And this teaches us the rule laid out in the Mishnah in Trumot, which we just cited. By implication, a deaf person who can speak or a mute who can hear would be obligated. Now these sets of texts then set up the very tumultuous and engaged conversation over what to do when sign language begins to make its presence felt in the world. And the question is, I now have a deaf mute. I might have someone who cannot hear and who cannot speak, but actually they can speak and they can hear through the signs that they make with their hands and that others make back to them. And how do I understand how to deal with that case? There are many, many modern poskim who tow the kind of formal language line and say, person's a deaf mute, what can I tell you? Chazal put that person in a category with the minor, with the mentally incapacitated, and even if you tell me they have some degree of intelligence, <coughs> all I can say is that it doesn't seem that Chazal considered that intelligence to be sufficient to put them in the category of PK. Others obviously say, that's crazy. This person clearly has exactly the intelligence that the Bavli and Chagiga already lays out. You would never compare them to a mentally incapacitated person or to a minor. And therefore, of course, they should be kipikrin l'chol divrehem. They should have a halachic status of fully mentally competent people for all purposes, marriage, divorce, slaughtering meat, uh, leading, uh, reading the Megillah, potentially even taking it. You know, my, my teacher, Rav Elisha Anshalovitz, who wrote a whole paper on this, on, uh, on Cheresh, takes this to the level of saying that a deaf person ought to be able to sign the Megillah, for instance, for someone who understands sign language. Because at the end of the day, it is a language. It's a language that's spoken with the hands, 
but it is a language. And even in areas where perhaps not just the ideas and words, since sign language is based on words as opposed to primarily letters, to the extent that letters are actually important, well, then they should be able to sign out the letters and thereby spell out the word and say. Now, there too, right? That's a sort of example where part of what I'm invested in you in understanding is, one, the possibility and power of simply articulating that category shift, which is to say, our khershim, our deaf mutes, are like their pikhin. They have the tools today to be able to function like the intelligent folks that Chazal are talking about. But I want you also to understand, even though I would not substantively defend it in this place, in light of what some of what we've seen, the kind of resistance and fear to opening up that category in a way that makes it feel like I might be taking leave of the world of Chazal. Chazal, at the end of the day, looked at someone who couldn't speak and couldn't hear and gave a ruling and now how can I come along and say, I'm giving a totally diametrically opposite word? Again, in light of what I said at the beginning, that that strikes me as ultimately not the safe way to play it, but probably in this case, a potential perversion of what the category was about in the first place. Uh, I wouldn't go that route. Right? Just to play it out in terms, of the, uh, in terms of the damages case here, imagine the irresponsibility of allowing a deaf person who is able fully to function in sign language to communicate and to hear from others to be completely irresponsible for the damage that their property causes to others, which is what I would have to do if I were slavishly applying Chazal's category from Baba Kama, right? What kind of society will that set up? What does it mean if when I'm counting people for a minion, I am excluding someone based on an assumption and a whole framework that they don't really get what's going on here when what I'm actually doing is excluding someone who knows full well what's going on and my decision to exclude them is doing something which is in fact unprecedented, which is to take a perfectly sentient being in the room and say, I'm going to ignore you for the purposes of counting me out, right? I would contend to you that part of the power of these category shifts is the notion that it may actually, in a way, be more conservative to employ the shift than to fail to employ it. Let's see two more examples of that, and then some concluding reflections, and then we'll talk a bit about this as a group. The status of Gentiles is yet another example where this often grates upon contemporary sensibilities because there are so many sources in Chazal that simply make a bright line distinction uh, between how Jews and Gentiles are treated. Not talking here about separations in the name of distinctiveness, talking about hierarchy of who ranks higher on the chain than someone else. So going to oxen once again, the Mishnah says here, if the ox of a Jew goes the ox of a Gentile, the Jew is exempt from damages. We don't have to worry, says the Mishnah, about the damage we cause to them. Even more dramatically, the Mishnah and Yoma, which we've been studying here in the yeshiva, if a building collapses on Shabbat and there is doubt as to whether there is a person there or not, or the person is there, but there's doubt as to whether he is still alive, or there is doubt as to whether he is Jewish, we still sort through the rubble to save him. Sorting through the rubble on Shabbat is forbidden. That's the assumption of this text. One is only justified doing it if there is a life at stake. And so therefore, I want to make sure that there's someone there, that the person is still alive, and that the person is Jewish. Now, the point of this text is actually to say, I don't have to be certain. There just has to be a possibility. But the implication is very clear. If I know the person is a Gentile, just like if I know they are dead, or if I know they are not there, then I am not justified in violating Shabbat. Okay? Now, again, there are different ways of grappling with a text like that. One is simply to embrace it and to come up with a logic uh, that actually justifies this and makes sense of why you wouldn't violate Shabbat for a Gentile, which would go something along the lines of you only violate Shabbat so that the person can observe Shabbat in the future, and this person is not going to do that, and therefore they don't warrant the violation of Shabbat. It's not something I think most of us in this room would be comfortable with. 
Another way is to sort of work around it, which is to say, well, if I don't save the Jew, the Gentile on Shabbat, there will be a pogrom. They will end up hating and killing me. And therefore, it is pikuach nefesh. It's going to ultimately harm my life. And mishum eva, for the fear that that will play out that way, I can then, in the local case, save this Gentile. But of course, the most direct way to engage it is by a category shift. And this is what Rabbi Menachem HaMeiri does in a few places in Beit HaBechira. So can I have a volunteer here just to play, say out the three uh, passages here in the Meiri, starting the one on Yoma 84a, then Gitin 62a, Bavakama 37b. Yes, please. Um, with respect to saving a life on Shabbat, we do not follow the majority. How so? In a courtyard with Jews and idolaters, we are not commanded to violate Shabbat for them since they have no Okay, that's a, that's a fragment that we didn't finish, but the notion here is that idolaters, for we are not commanded to violate Shabbat for them, since they have no religion, that's how I translated here, dat has a much broader notion in the Meiri that also goes to social structure, which you'll see in a minute. Keep going, nonetheless. Nonetheless, nations that are bound by the ways of religion and beliefs in the existence of God and God's unity, even if they are slightly confused according to our faith, these things in no way apply to them. Okay, next. Because they don't care about anyone's property other than their own, we penalize them, say that they will not become accustomed to destroying things. And according to what it says in the Gemara, this only applies to nations that are not bound by the ways of religion and norms. As it says about them in the Gemara, God saw that the Gentiles did not even fulfill the seven weeks vote given to them and declared their property a free for all. This applies when they deserve it. But if they keep the seven weeks vote, then our own judicial uh, treatment of them should be like theirs of us, and we should show no favor whatsoever to our own. It hardly need be said that this is true with regard to nations banned by the ways of religion and To sum up, Nuhri, foreigner, Gentile in Chazal, does not mean 14th century Provencal Christians. That's the Meiri's claim. Don't be fooled by the fact that we call them Goyim also. We call them Nuhrim also. That has nothing to do with it, says the Meiri. When you're engaging the question of how does this category apply? You have to look at what the category means. And to the extent that we're leaving someone under the rubble, it's presumably because we think this person is basically a barbarian that is going to do nothing to advance the very civilized norms that we're committed to when we engage with the question of saving a life on Shabbat and having that trumpet. When we talk about not having any civil monetary responsibility to this person, that presumes a person who lives a complete barbarian justice, uh, life of justice, where they would do nothing to protect our damages, to protect our civil rights in that way. And therefore, it's appropriate for us, midah keneged midah, to do the same to them. But once that doesn't apply, says the Meiri, the category shifts in and of itself. Finally, the status of women. Women fall often into a different grouping in Chazal. Not now with the mentally incompetent, but with the socially subservient. Nashim, Avadim, Uktanim. Women, slaves, and minors. Those who have studied with me before know that whenever we learn this text in the context of a larger discussion, I ask everyone just to pause and think about how strange and problematic and offensive it seems to us to even utter that as a triad. The notion that we would group those three together is itself jarring. But as you already saw from the Bavli and Chagiga, potentially also instructive as to what the category actually means when engaged in the text. And that is the category that then produces among the most familiar rules in this regard, the notion laid out in the Mishnah and Kiddushin that positive time-bound commandments, women are exempted from it. But if you really want to feel the context leading you to an uncomfortable place, look at the Bavli and Minachot, where in the context of writing sacred texts, we have a text that says, a Sefer Torah, Tfilin or Mizuzot, ready for this list, written by a heretic, a Samaritan, a Gentile, a slave, a woman, a minor, or an apostate are invalid. Not great company to be in, as it says, and you shall tie them and you shall write them. Anyone who is included in the tying, seemingly of tefillin, 
is included in the writing of Tefillin and the other sacred texts closely related to it, and anyone who is not included in the tying is not included in the writing. Now, that kind of jarring nature of seeing a text that treats women in that category and puts them in a category, we would, but even, even the greatest apologist for Hazal today would never put women in that category speaking in the 21st century. The, what they might do is say, no, actually, they're two different categories, but they were merged into the same text, and for two different reasons, they're exempt from this, but not because they're all in the same category, right? Because there's just no way to say that in terms of our reality today, to say that women are like slaves and minors. So the question is, what does one do with that? And harking back for a moment to what I spoke about last week, there is sort of this, then, choice. One either goes to a place of totally understandable alienation, and one says, wow, I think about this category in this way, these texts think about this category in this way, therefore, I and this text really don't have anything to say to each other. I and this discourse really can't communicate. We've reached sort of the breaking point of our relationship, and that's it. And that's understandable. It has all the obvious drawbacks of the ending of any relationship, uh, as played out here through text. But there's, of course, another option which is to engage the notion of a category shift. And to understand that, well, perhaps I could understand the notion that adjunct subservient members of society, which whether I like it or not, at one point, clearly and transparently included women, <coughs> might make sense to have some of the legal regime that played out here, or one could at least understand, if not excuse it, to explain why these categories are the way they are, but without forcing myself to apply that category to a reality where it makes not only no sense, but anti-sense. This point has been most productively engaged by Rav Yoel Binun, contemporary rabbi, prominent figure in uh, Israeli public discourse, and he writes the following. Most women in our day are benot chorin, which I translated here as independent slash liberated. And they bear no resemblance to slaves because there is no higher power over them. Therefore, anyone who cites the rulings of the sages, which are based on the notion that, quote, a woman is similar to a slave in all arenas, fails to understand that he is transferring a halakha from one reality to another without any basis whatsoever. Our women, Nashim Shalanu, are not only all important, as the Ramah already said, but they are independent slash liberated. It is obvious that we are not speaking about the same category of nashim. Now, someone could argue on the facts or on the merits with Rabbi Yol Binu and say, you're not so liberated as you thought, or the, the true revolution has not yet come, and until it has, until society is actually really egalitarian, the halakha should be a lagging rather than a leading indicator on this front. But without engaging that point, and without getting into too deeply my personal sympathies for Rav Yol Binun as opposed to the opposite, what I want you to see here is the possibility of the articulation in halakhic language of simply saying, no, I would never presume for a minute that just because the word isha is used in a second century CE text, and I use the word isha in modern Hebrew to mean something, that those two must necess necessarily or even possibly, plausibly, mean the same thing. And just as we have to ask, is a tanur really a tanur? Or maybe it's a kira. Is gihutz really gihutz? Or maybe it's kibus, etc., etc., etc. We certainly have to ask, all the more so, in the question of key questions of citizenship and belonging, does isha so obviously mean isha? And it then opens up, I would contend to you, all sorts of possibilities of how to play that out. Now, this can, of course, go too far. Okay? And let's take one example of how it can go too far. The Torah says in Bereshit Yud Zayin that there's a requirement to circumcise all males. And it says, a clear circumcision of the flesh in order to be a part of God's covenant. However, 
Dvarim elsewhere seems to use the language mila of circumcision not to refer to the flesh, but umaltemet or lat levavchem. But actually the circumcising of one's heart is part of what God really wants. And in fact, your miyahu elsewhere seems to almost make a kind of equivalence of, yeah, you know, all the Gentiles, they're physically uncircumcised, but all the Jews are completely emotionally uncircumcised. And therefore, they both each have their own problems. To which Paul of Tarsus in Romans makes the potentially reasonable conclusion, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inward. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Now that I think we can all agree from an internal Jewish perspective goes too far, irrespective of whether that is a possible, compelling, beautiful, allegorical reading of the Bible. There's no way to retain Paul's reading the way he does it here and remain within the confines of what anyone would recognize as Jews. And the question is, how can one distinguish between the category shifts that we just went through and this, which is after all simply to say, circumcision doesn't mean circumcision, you idiot. It means a physical act that's supposed to inspire a certain spiritual state of being and if there is a better way of getting to that spiritual state of being, like having a different kind of covenantal mission to the Gentiles, then obviously that's what the Torah and the God of Israel wants. Sounds kind of compelling, right? Okay, so the question is, how does one identify the distinction between the two of those? And here I think the key thing is that there are two red lines when it comes to how one does and does not articulate something as a halachic position. The first red line is ignorance is unacceptable, which is to say the simple failure to know and be aware of the sources that are out there on a given topic, such that when one is articulating some kind of halachic position, some kind of halachic articulation, one has not even actually engaged with the data that is out there is one red line that really has something simply depart from the halachic conversation. Talk in a minute about halacha as language, but the notion that one would articulate, uh, one would articulate something in English while lopping off 50% of the vocabulary uh, would be something I think we would look at as a kind of stilted, impossible, and unsuccessful uh, articulation of a certain kind of idea. But the second red line is avoiding doing what I think is distinctive about what Paul does here, which is a kind of le a language of abrogation that leaves the legal conversation in disarray behind it. As opposed to engaging in a category shift, which says, there's all these categories that are out there, and I'm just telling you my reality, what I describe as A and they describe as A, my A is actually their B but I'm still fundamentally operating in the world of the earlier categories. As opposed to Paul comes along, no one's being circumcised anymore. If you'll permit me for a minute, it's not as if Paul says, today, all of us are hemophiliacs. Therefore, we're all exempt from circumcision. While that might be implausible and not play in Peoria, and therefore might not be an actual successful category shift, that would nonetheless be the sort of halachic way of talking about why circumcision is not being practiced. Not there's techelet on the tzitzit, but I've decided we don't need that anymore. Rather, techelet has been lost, and here's why there's not a deep need to try to figure out how to recover. The way that one talks about something, even when getting to the, second, to the same end, actually makes, I think, a critical difference as to whether something is a part of the conversation of halakha or not. And that is a key red line for understanding what is in and what is out. And this point, I think, is made compellingly by Rav Hutner in this short passage that I brought you here, talking about something else in a beautiful ma'amar worth studying on its own terms. But Rav Hutner, who is 20th century, uh, 
Israel, America, a prominent educator and rabbi in the 20th century, writes the following, included within the principle that these and these are the words of the living God is the fundamental notion that the rejected halachic opinion in any conversation is also a legitimate view of Torah, imrak ne'emra lefi gidrei amasa umatan shel Torah provided it was articulated according to the boundaries of discussion of the oral Torah. Not provided it had a certain conclusion, but that the way that conclusion was arrived at and articulated really was a part of the conversation. And what I think this pushes us to, and this is how I want to kind of wrap up uh, the conversation tonight, is really asking us to embrace the notion of halakha as a language not as a set of data points of law, but as a language for addressing normative needs and concerns. Like English or any other language, there is tremendous elasticity and near, not total, but near infinite possibility of expression. A language can certainly create space for conflicting ideas, even when it's being used to express normative claims. But languages do have grammar and they therefore also thus have limitations on how one says things. In English, you can't really begin a declaratory sentence with a verb. In halakha, I can permit performing what might seem like a problematic activity on Shabbat, but I will do so by saying that is not melakha, not by saying Shabbat is on Sunday. Moreover, this grammar can evolve over time. Usage, spelling can change to the point where an abrupt shift from one period to another becomes hard to bridge. A contemporary reader, when they pick up Beowulf, recognizes it as being written in English, but it's hard for them to read it. And if they ever got up in a room today and spoke in Beowulf English, they would be laughed out of the room. Similarly in Halakha, there are paths that the conversation take that define the ways in which things are not said. The art of midrash halacha, of going straight to the verses and simply rereading them to produce a new kind of reading, while the way halacha was spoken in the time of the Tanaim, if spoken that way today, would be like someone having a conversation with you in early medieval English. Furthermore, Languages, and this is where the substantive piece of language comes in, and you can't just say anything, languages are limited by some of their basic cultural assumptions. <coughs> the urban myth, which I've since been told is just that, about the number of words for snow in Eskimo language, uh, nonetheless, whether it's true or not, makes the point that certain languages have ways of talking about things that others lack. You know, the vocabulary, the number of words in English as opposed to the number of words in Hebrew runs about seven to one, okay? That means that the poetry of Wordsworth is gonna look different from the poetry of Yehuda Amichai. There are simply going to be ways in which certain things can and will be said in one language and allusions can and will not be made in one language that will not happen in the other. And halacha is a language of obligation and responsibility, as well as a language of circumstance and life. And any attempt to turn it into a language focused only on the ideal, or as a language of abstract spirituality, will ultimately be speaking an impoverished version of it, and so overwhelming it with loan words, so as to totally undermine the integrity of its existence. But for all of those limitations, it remains a language nonetheless. And we must therefore, I would suggest to you, eschew expressions such as keeping halakha and instead talk about observing mitzvot. If I can sum up, halakha is the language for applying the mitzvot to our lives. Mitzvot can be listed and performed, but halakha must be spoken. If tonight's conversation has convinced you of anything, it ought to be that this language is far richer than commonly imagined and that it is capable of expressing even diametrically opposed opinions in a shared discourse. That richness and multiplicity is a key reason, if not the key reason, that we must reclaim and rebrand the term halakha 
to capture its essential nature and character. Rather than speaking incessantly about loyalty to, or lack thereof, to halacha, we should talk about commitment to mitzvot. Instead of using the adjective halachic to refer to specific sanctioned behaviors and positions, we should use it to refer to arguments and articulations that can fairly be read as continuous with the Jewish people's past normative discussions. We have to have the conviction to speak this language. To be a part of the conversation of halacha is to embrace the observance of mitzvot and to be committed to applying them to and integrating them into our lives. It means cross-checking our decisions against the wealth of opinion and guidance in our tradition and allowing the insights of poskim past and present to shape those decisions. But it also means bringing our whole selves to the conversation with all the messy details of our lives and searching, often with the guidance of a more learned mentor, for the language that allows us the mitzvot, allows the mitzvot to speak most directly to who we are. As Yitro challenged us, we are looking for haderech asher yelchuba, the path that can actually lead us to substance and meaning. And what Halacha has the promise of doing for us each individually is to tell us the Hamaaseh Asher Yasun, the actions that will actually make that a reality. Stop there and welcome conversation, questions, etc. Yes, F and then um, Question which actually I had last week and then I thought was relatively relevant and I think it's relevant again to your conclusion is would you say that the word, that the idea of a hook is no longer, is not applicable in your your vision of halakha, the idea of saying halakha, uh, where you say, Great question. Uh, good. Take a couple, yeah, Ben. Uh, so this idea of Purim Torah, where people deliberately take halakha language and use it to like, say things that they deliberately mean not to be halakha and joke. So how do we like, draw the line between people that are like, people that can like, use halakha language and people that don't use halakha language? Because you know, pervert it totally, but still use that language. Great. Take one more in this set. Yeah. Uh, what's the role of people who aren't rabbis in like, uh, coming up with like, novel ideas interpretations or uh, like, moving to this like, overall system that you're proposing and also in like, Great. Um, OK, so let me start with, uh, with Chok. I'll tell you how I think about Chok. I am totally on board with the notion that there are things that we don't understand that we do anyway. I am not on board with the notion that there are things that run contrary to something that actively would make, that's something that makes actively nonsense, okay? Um, that is somehow some sort of deep path. In that sense, just the Rama, which is to say that in any relationship, there are things that you do for the other person that you don't fully understand that they ask you to do in the context of that relationship as an element of trust because you have a meaningful relationship with them. That plays out with a spouse. It plays out with children being asked to do things for their parents that they don't yet understand. But the thing that always undergirds that, and when it doesn't, we consider the relationship abusive, is that there is mutual trust that the other person has your best interests in mind. And I am willing to go with a hope the whole distance as long as it seems like, yeah, this makes sense that God might have my best interest in mind. When you get to the point where the language of chok is used to sort of defend, oh, this is yours, sorry, I'm switching the two of you up, right? This is the language of chok is used to defend, um, actually to defend things that are actively and clearly and obviously like painful, hurtful, and abusive. Then I think we're actually abusing what that term was ever about. Um, and I don't think we have to give up the notion that there are mysteries in life, there are mysteries with our relationship with God. There are things that there's actually something beautiful about sometimes doing things that you don't understand. Um, you might, shaking a lulav in a trog, like not get what it's about and sort of disappear almost into the mystical el uh, element of that moment. Uh, and I think that's not only not bad, it's probably good. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, lulav in a trog doesn't uh, crush anyone and doesn't hurt them, and doesn't, you know, at least properly wield it um, <laughs> in a way that, um, you know, that, that makes that, create that kind of crisis. Purim Torah, I actually think I would answer you by saying 
that shuvatcha um, betzidcha, right? That basically the the fact that what is distinctive about Purim time? It's articulated in a halachic language. It sounds totally ridiculous, and it's completely laughed down because everyone knows that couldn't be the case. And maybe that's another thing. If I were sort of expanding this further and talking about red lines, you know, the Rosh talks about this in uh, in his commentary on uh, on Masechet Sanhedrin. Talks about a, one of the key kind of tests from whether there's a, a position can legitimately be articulated, and whether someone can, you know, even make a bold claim in the face of something of the contrary of the Gemara, is whether the people of that person's generation accept that interpretation. Uh, and that, I think, is a real and important consideration to the extent that you articulate a category shift, for instance, that is completely not compelling. Like, you can't actually get anyone who cares about mitzvot to sign on to it. That's probably not such a good category shift, right? And maybe, I don't, you know, I don't want to get into sort of thing of that it's not a halakhic position, but just speaking in Darwinian terms, it's unlikely to survive. It's likely to end up being a kind of quirky articulation by some person who had a brave new world vision that they were playing out, but they never actually caught up. Um, so while I'm sure, I'm not saying that someone can't kind of abuse that language. I, I am saying that on some level, to the extent someone got up and told the Purim Torah, and no one laughed, maybe it's a good or position, <laughs> right? That may be the case. Um, the role of non-rabbis, it's a big, it's a big question. Um, some of this I've alluded to in a number of different ways over these past few weeks. Um, you know, some of the clear things I've tried to state without, without too much of any ambivalence is one of the roles of non-rabbis is buying into a commitment to mitzvot and being sort of a part of the practicing reality of, uh, of what this discourse is talking about uh, and thereby kind of, you know, uh, grounding it more in a, in a broader base and a more representative base of Jews uh, who are, who are uh, actually, actually practicing. Um, another piece, I think, you know, this also goes to a question of stance, then it will reflect on also sort of the practical politics of it. Um, the stance of, you know, both being open uh, and humble in that sense of really hearing what the tradition has to say, even when at first blush it grates on you in a certain kind of way, um, but also not, you know, not giving up on yourself and your own integrity and continuing to bring the question and the challenge that you feel you haven't yet heard articulated by the person teaching the text. Um, you know, it's interesting, the next pasuk, uh, you know, of course, is um, from what I began with, is Then, that on some level there is this interplay of, yeah, well, there is clearly some role for People who are spending more time thinking about this, who are, uh, who are, you know, playing this out as rabbis, as halachas, whatever it is you want to, you want to, uh, you want to call them. There is some leadership piece that's com that is uh, critical, but there needs to be kind of this constant interaction with the am, who are who are bought in, who are, who are the case law to which this whole thing is responding. Um, and in that sense, I think I don't know to the extent that you can sort of demand and encourage that kind of relationship of partnership and trust um, sort of on both sides, that would go a long way to helping our situation. But I don't know, there's a lot more to be said about that I have to think about. Yes, a few more questions. Um, does, uh, does your approach militate that the change be incremental or can it be radical? And related to what you're saying about sometimes someone puts the test balloon and no one goes along with it, right. um, Berger, for example, made a position Right. Let me take uh, one more. Yeah. Um, I find very compelling the notion of Apollo as a language, but you know, it seems to me that the sentence. It is permissible and praiseworthy at all times and places to run around randomly murdering people and then offering their corpses to idols is, is a, a sentence that I think English would be a very poor language you couldn't say. Um, and I think you can't say that holotically. And I want to say that the reason you can't say it holotically is something deeper than cultural assumptions, which are temporarily bound. I want to say you can't say that holotically because it's evil and 
God thanks for your hug. Okay, good. I'll take one more. There's one other question. Yeah. Could you, could you really explain your distinction between like um, category shift Yes. Yeah, I'll try to I'll try to do that do that again. Let, let me take that one first, and then I'll come back to, to these other ones. Um, and again, this is all with the proviso. This is I'm still sort of you know working this through, and you're all helping me do that. Um, the, the what I see as different in Romans. I, I, okay, I'll, I'll say it by this way. I said I was going to come back to this, and I did it. So now's a good time to come back. To it. It's interesting to me that the, one of the main category shifts that seems to just get blown out of the water, the ones we've seen is the Ravya on recline. Um, it comes back with women when they're not reclining otherwise, but basically no one is like, well, yeah, we don't recline because we sit, whether, by the way, people actually do that today is a separate question. Right? I think there's a lot of people who eat their Seder and don't hang off the side of their chair. Um, but in terms of sort of like, you know, it sort of being completely ingested by the halacha conversations about reclining um, and spitting that out, um, what I think it, one of the reasons I think the Rav Yaf fails is he doesn't really replace reclining with anything, right? It just sort of gets replaced with like, no, oh, you just sit like a regular person and that's what it is now. Um, in a way, if he had maybe spelled out like it's about having China or this or that or the other thing, like it's another sort of specific legal requirement. It's gonna look different, but there's another legal requirement my suspicion is that's part of what does that category shift in, is that it doesn't actually work with a different thing. You see, when they move away, when they put stuff in the, in the ovens, they're able to say, no, no, we're just following this Mishnah instead of that Mishnah. The Rav Yad basically has to say, this Mishnah is now obsolete, and he doesn't really have anything to replace it with. And that's what I see Paul as doing that's different, which is to say, he comes in and he's basically like, there was once this thing of Israel in the flesh, like, it's just not where it's at anymore, right? Um, there was this thing of circumcision. It's not that he's saying, now we do this instead of circumcision. He's saying, physical circumcision has missed the point. Now, he is saying we do something, which is this sort of emotional, spiritual circumcision. But that's not, this is, and this is sort of why I began with the quote that I was talking about, like, asun. part of what I think the discourse of halakha is invested in is concrete actions that act out that path. The sort of aspirational model of here's where we're going to spiritually, that's the derech, like that's key. Halakha withers without that. But without the ma'asim asher asun, you go to a different place, I think, ultimately. And that's what I think is different fundamentally about Paul's project, ultimately, which is there is with a lot of things, not with everything, right? But with a lot of things, there is a downgrading of, you know, you're so caught up in these actions, you're actually missing the big picture. And it's not that I'm replacing them with this action as opposed to that. I'm trying to get you to transcend that language of be caring so much about action. I don't know if that helps. Like when, when the Rambam said that the Dalish said that women are the virus that women are like going for me, and he said, no, they have a mission that they have a little bit of a mission that they don't do. Like, he just also said, no, like, not really. I guess that's what he says. Right, if you're saying they have to lean, you're always on safer ground, because then you're effectively saying, women today, like, Kuala Nashim Chashuvot is saying, we're just shifting this person to this category. The prior category we have. We're working with the prior categories. We're not saying, hey, let's move away from these silly categories. Okay. That, I think, is part of the difference. Um, change, uh, so let, let, I'll go in reverse order, contrary to how the uh, Mishnah Navot says you identify an intelligent person. Um, <laughs> the language, uh, the, uh, the language question. Yeah, so I want to think about that more and think about the sharper language for <laughs> playing that out. Um, which is to say, you know, I, I don't know exactly what like the SAT analogy, I still have analogies on the SAT, everything's yeah. different now. No, it's gone, right? Okay. When, when I was little, right, SATs were called, okay. So in any event, um, the, uh, the, question of, the question of language as you're talking about it, look, English is about can I just express anything to make it understood? And in that sense, going with the metaphor of halakha's language requires that the analogy is not just, can I articulate anything so it could be understood? It is, can I sort of, with the normative building blocks, um, articulate a normative position? And what I would say is, the, the relevant thing is, you couldn't have jumbled the words in that sentence in 
any number of orders and still made it intelligible to me what you were saying in English because of the grammatical rules of how you have to say that. Similarly, there are certain substantive positions, and that's what I gave the example of, like, you can't say Shabbat is on Sunday, even if you can get to the same result of when I'm here on Saturday afternoon, I can do X by way of using the grammar of this thing is not a melacha. Now, by the way, there's some things you also can't say. Like, you can't really say that writing is not a melacha, though you could say this is not writing because it's disposable, because it's only about scribal arts, because it's only in Hebrew, right? Any number of things. I mean, that's what Hilchot Shabbat is sort of full of. It's like, well, yeah, you know, shearing a sheep is melacha, but like this isn't shearing because I'm doing something else. And so while we would have to play that out more, I would say it's not the, that's where, that's where the metaphor takes you to a different place because it's not just a language of articulation, it's a language of normative articulation. And therefore, yeah, you can't say anything just like you can't structure your sentence any way you want in English. We can talk about it more. Now coming back to your point about change being incremental, On some level, no, meaning I, I'm not invested in any way like for its own sake and change being incremental, except in as much as incremental change reflects actual incremental change in society such that you would have to speak incrementally about shifting those categories, right? That, I think, is often the case. And that goes to even the issues that we've talked through here tonight, right? And this is what I think, you know, so once you recognize that you can say you can say Isha doesn't mean Isha. Provencal Christian doesn't mean, right, 21st century woman doesn't mean Isha. Provencal Christian doesn't mean Goy, etc., etc. Then it actually makes you think much more deeply of, well, that's really interesting. So why isn't everyone saying that? And, okay, sometimes it's because they haven't heard this year, okay? But a lot of times, but a lot of times it's because they're actually ambivalent about the substantive question at hand, right? With the case of, let's say, Gentiles and saving lives on Shabbat, I wouldn't say we're at a point where, like, the Jewish-Gentile relationship is, like, all tied up in a bow and, like, we figured it out and, like, there's no residue from the Holocaust, there's no residue from sort of all of Jewish history and a sense of victimization, et cetera, et cetera. That, yeah, like, even when people feel intellectually like they want to be in a certain place, they might not be ready to go deep into that pool. Similarly, with questions of gender and feminism, I alluded to this before, questions of lagging and leading indicator, you know, I think there are people who are genuinely still working through, feeling like, I don't know if we've arrived at the promised land of gender equality, such that I feel it's so obvious and transparent to just say, well, of course, women means men, etc. Um, and that, in a way, you get a, you get a vision of, the, of that in the Tosafot, where on the one hand, they make this statement, all our women are important. Well, meantime, it wasn't like so obvious that every woman from that point forward was reclining at the Seder. So what was that about? Hard to know just from those sources alone. Um, but I think that's key. Rabbi Yol, be new, and I'll end with this. And I'm happy to take people individually, but I want to let people go. Um, Rabbi Yol, be new, and so I had the privilege of uh, meeting him about a year and a half ago. And this was like there were two questions on my list. The other had to do with Bir Kalamazon, which was another story. Um, there were two questions on my list. I wanted to know, like, what's going on? And um, I said, I know that you have, some have heard me tell this story, I know that uh, you have this position that women today are benot chorin, and therefore they're obligated in all time bound mitzvot, a woman can't say, well, I'm a woman, so I'm exempt. Um, and um, I want to know, like, would you take that to the level of saying that, you know, a woman who is classically in Chazal exempt from the mitzvah of shofar, could blow a shofar for a man and he could fulfill his obligation. So he said to me, I suppose if I were sick at home and I couldn't go to shul and my wife knew how to blow shofar and she blew it for me on Rosh Hashanah, yeah, I would say I would fulfill my obligation. But she wouldn't agree to do it. <laughs> And so it's a fitting way to end with your question of sort of incremental change, right? There were sort of two things he was reflecting there. One is, by the normal rules of the world he's in, that would only come up if he were sick, because otherwise he'd be going to a show where that wouldn't be the person who would be assigned that rule. And he wasn't yet at a place with his wife or many others like her where they're raring to go to step up to that rule and embrace that category shift themselves. 
But what I think was important about that conversation is he essentially acknowledged that aside from that sociological plane and therefore in a different kind of sociological frame, uh, yeah, in principle, he was dead serious about this category shift and it felt that he had more integrity in his pursuit of the meaning of halakha rather than less. Thank you very much. It's been a great three weeks. Is anybody interested in a marriage minion now? For sure.